Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Parish Art Museum and welcome to the 36th volume of Pecha Kucha Night Hamptons here at the Parish Art Museum. Yeah, thank you, thanks for coming. My name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the Senior Curator of Arts Reach and Special Projects here at the Parish, and it's a pleasure to be your MC tonight. Um, the Hamptons is part of over 700 cities um, from all over the world that are hosting Pecha Kucha Nights, and tonight Pecha Kucha is also happening in Košice, Slovakia, and in Alberta, Canada. So Pecha Kucha is named for the sound of chit-chat in Japanese. The presenters use a very simple format of 20 images at 20 seconds per image, so each presentation is just under seven minutes, and that's a bunch of architects who figured out if architects, architects start talking, they'll talk forever. So you, if you enjoy it, you'll have seven wonderful minutes, and you know, it's also over after seven minutes. So, um, so Pecha Kucha Hamptons is a wonderful way to find out about what our many creatives living on the east end of Long Island are up to, to meet your neighbors, to network, to make connections, and so forth. And uh, tonight we have a wonderful lineup of seven artists, writers, and photographers. So please give them a welcome, a very warm welcome, because it's really not easy to put this together and to put yourself in front of so many people. So please welcome our presenters. I would also like to thank our sponsors who make the Friday nights possible. That's presenting sponsor Bank of America with additional support by Vile Cornell Medicine, Southampton, and the Corcoran Group. And I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Olivia Mengini, who puts these programs together, and Victor Miranda, who is our uh, tech support. Yes, thank you. So let's get started. Um, our first presenter is Sarah Alford. She is a writer and photographer. Her work has appeared in East Magazine, the East Hampton Star, and Express Magazine. Sarah's interest in horticulture extends to the animal world, reveling in the small world native host plants that support butterflies and other pollinators. She's a master gardener, board member of Breakwater Yard Club, and recent board member of the Horticultural Alliance of the Hamptons. Please welcome Sarah. Thanks very much for coming tonight. After initial excitement about being invited, dread and second guessing set in. I imagined myself amongst a group of insightful local voices, and here I am talking about little butterflies. I hope there's to sound less like Chauncey the Gardener and more like Scott Chasky. Maybe I can persuade you there's magic inside these little lives. While my garden has always been filled with flowers for wildlife, that shifted when a friend asked me to babysit monarch chrysalis she'd raised. It was the first summer of COVID, my guest room was empty, and I said yes. Since then, I've raised dozens of butterflies that stayed with me briefly, and one special butterfly who lived with me for nearly a month. This is Pablo. Usually people interject and ask, what happened to Pablo? But let me start at the beginning. Eggs start off so inauspiciously, a pearly egg the size of punctuation in The New Yorker, odds are against them. In the wild, one in 10 caterpillars becomes a butterfly. In my peaceful guest bedroom, without predators, pesticides, or air conditioning, that statistic is inverted. Among the predators are birds and carnivores like this baby praying mantis. They eat eggs for protein, just like we do. This is in Bridgehampton. This is a long 20 seconds. <laughs> they grow up so fast. In two weeks, they grow from a tiny egg into a full-size caterpillar. Their black feet look like tap shoes, which I'm sure is nature's way of charming us. There's about a, a week uh, between the small and the large. And the double-ended antenna is a bit of, uh, it's it, one of its few defenses. Uh, one day, the caterpillars know it's time to change, and they hang motionless from a dollop of their own thread. Underneath those stripes, monarch caterpillars create a transparent chrysalis containing everything they need to create wings. Monarch chrysalis look like precious jade amulets hanging from branches. 
Inside, the caterpillar liquefies into a pr primordial soup that's turned into a butterfly. It goes from a genderless caterpillar to a gendered butterfly. And that's the same branch as the previous slide. A chrysalis cracks open slowly like an eggshell. You'd think uh, um, in its usual butterfly efficiency they'd be pressed and presentable, but they fall out like rumpled clothes from an overpacked suitcase. Consider the length of the chrysalis and the length of its future wingspan. Yet within an hour, their wings are flattened, pumped, fluid, pumped with fluid. Um, sometimes I thought I'd had a productive morning, and then I'd look up from my desk to see a butterfly had emerged from a chrysalis. They're so knowing in their actions patiently letting their wings flatten and dry. This is how I found Pablo on the pavement during a September nor'easter. He lived on a windy stretch of beach where milkweed was thrashed into ribbons. I took him and a couple of other caterpillars home to give them fresh milkweed. This might have been Pablo shedding his skin uh, a few hours after leaving that blustery beach. His translucent, translucent yellow face developed stripes and his legs uh, had this metallic sheen to them, uh, so otherworldly. After resting, resting, the stripes deepened, he walked off as if nothing happened and then he ate his skin. Um, this is Pablo. He emerged one morning from his chrysalis with a wing inverted. Usually butterflies sway rhythmically to let their wings flatten, but he was agitated as if he could sense his balance was different. But this is how I like to remember him, content on the top of this native great blue lobelia. He was picky, despite being entirely dependent on me. He refused native goldenrod and asters and loved this non-native butterfly bush. Truthfully, I don't blame him, it smells like honey. But hopped up on nectar, he'd try to fly. The instinct uh, was pressing as the chill in the autumn air grew. One morning, I took him outside uh, and discovered dew clinging to the flowers. Instantly, he unfurled his proboscis and sipped a dew drop the size of his head in one gulp. I had, uh, held out my hand to uh, take him back, home, back inside, and he stomped his foot to stay and promptly st tripped on his uh, antenna, which is what you see there. Um, how did I know Pablo was male? The novelist Vladimir Nabokov was a lepidopterist who studied but butterfly genitalia for uh, ta uh, taxonomy. Male monarchs have barbed genitalia, but also an extra dot on their wings. It's easier to look for the dot than the barb uh, barbed prickly parts. In retrospect, I was curious. <laughs> um, Pablo and I developed a routine where he'd spend mornings outside or feast on bouquets. Um, but I also belong to a cooperative farm, and he'd ride in the car with me and then hang on flowers while I gardened. He began to recognize me. If I held up my hand, he'd climb up and tickle the pads of my fingers from, with the barbs on his legs. And I confess I used Pablo to get closer to other butterflies because otherwise they wouldn't come near me. Um, I th regret th not showing others tonight, but I adore these skippers with their uh, saucer-like eyes. It's, it's fair to say I spent more hours with Pablo than some ex-boyfriends. I wondered what he thought of me. I assumed um, I, I was admittedly growing fond of him. Uh, one day on a Zoom, I felt a tickle on my hand as Pablo climbed up my arm to my shoulder, and I thought, he likes me. In fact, he sought a higher place from which to fly. Um, I dropped my pen so I could scoot out of the Zoom screen. People suggested I leave Pablo outside to let nature take its course, but I couldn't do that. I think my own experience of coping with my own immobility made me want to leave him, give his, him as much happiness as possible. I was hit by a car riding my bike, and my five-year recovery definitely heightened my compassion. And this is his last day. Um, it was blustery, just like the day I found him, and um, the flowers were fading. I didn't know what I would do, um, but uh, one afternoon in the sun, I checked on him, and he was gone. Um, what happened is a question I don't know the answer to, but it's a question everyone asks. Um, but I don't know the answer, but I think a blue jay helped him to fly. Aww. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your very special 
story uh, about Pablo. Um, we hope he has a beautiful afterlife. It's funny, a lot of uh, presenters talk about their pets, and we've had people talk about their cats and dogs, but never about the caterpillar, so thank you. So next up is Brianna Hernandez. Uh, Brianna is a Chicana artist, curator, educator, and death doula guided by socially engaged practices. She credits her creative development to her late mother and mentor, Silvia D. Hernandez, whose creativity, resilience, and compassion was a rich source of inspiration. Brianna's work focuses on the experience of providing end-of-life care, grieving processes, and mourning rituals based on her lived experiences, cultural research, and collaborations with colleagues. She is a board secretary at Mass House and BIPOC Art Studio on the Shinnecock Indian Nation, and I'm very proud to say that Brianna is also our curatorial fellow here at the parish. Please welcome Brianna. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I wrote an intro slide for mine, so I'm going to start with that as well. Um, as Corinne mentioned, I'm a Chicana artist, curator, educator, and death doula. I recently moved out to the Shinnecock Nation all the way from Wisconsin, so I'm excited to be getting to know my new home and my new neighbors. As an artist, I create immersive installations out of many materials, including large-scale charcoal drawings, as you can see here. But the main focus of my work is on the experiences of grief and end-of-life care with the intention of nurturing empathy, education, and community around these often taboo topics. I've been an artist my entire life, but my work changed to focus on grief after I became my mother's caregiver in the final year of her life. She and her legacy are the inspiration for all that I do. This is my mother, Sylvia, with little me attached to her hip, <laughs> as usual. I started this grief work um, with the video series Anticipatory Después, shortly after my mother's passing, to take an honest look at the raw emotions of early grief and where they overlap with the anticipatory grief of caregiving for those with a terminal illness. Um, so this is an installation shot um, from one of those first videos where I'm shattering glass. And each video is paired with these installations to create an environment where the viewer can enter into a space, perhaps adjust their posture or move around something, acting as a bridge towards understanding an experience that they may not have been through, but they can physically step into. And all of these are paired with materials that are from the recorded videos to further that sense of immersion. As the viewer enters an environment, the video illustrates, the sound asks them to listen, and the materials engage their senses in that narrative. Some of the shattered glass in question. <laughs> um, this is an ongoing series that's both intended to connect with grievers and non-grievers alike, to dispel harmful misinformation about what grief is supposed to look like, and share permission for nuanced and unique expressions of loss. The second series that I started in this ongoing work, Utiles Curativos, focuses more on the family caregiver and their physical and emotional labor by taking common caregiver medical equipment and transforming it into sacred objects. This is one of the first installations of that. This transformation and elevation is done through gilding with silver, gold, and copper leafing a delicate process in and of itself which requires its own care and attentiveness. And they're then placed onto altars, an iconographic symbol of holiness across many faiths. These are some bed pads here, followed by a pill case and heating pad. These intention of the objects is to remind the caregiver of the sacred acts they perform, and in doing so, remind them of their own sacredness in these stressful and emotional circumstances where there's often little time and space for the caregiver's needs to be met themselves. A lot of what you're seeing here is the details of some of the other materials, taking syringes, taking gauze, and thinking how else can it be elevated? How else can light pass through it to show that sacredness and the honor in these objects? Some little pill cases. <laughs> My most recent series, Aquí Descansamos, takes a broader look at communal mourning practices 
through the template of the Western Cemetery. By using plants to sculpt common grave marker shapes, I've created a living cemetery inspired by green burial practices across time and around the world. These sculptures counter the monochromatic conventional gravestones we're used to seeing, such as the grass marker, casket marker, or slant marker, by replacing static gray stone with growth, color, and change over the course of an installation. And just like grief, these sculptures are ever-changing. Some days blooming, some days decomposing, some days hibernating beneath the surface. And just like grief, they also need tending, sometimes watering, sometimes weeding, sometimes just being allowed to grow in an unexpected direction. In multiple versions of this series, Aquiles Cansamos is an invitation for others to consider what else memorialization and honoring our loved ones can look like. This includes thinking of what our own future wishes would be when we rest alongside those who have gone before us. This is the first fully outdoor installation I did. I've also become certified as a death doula through the course of my artwork and research into this topic. Um, this role is really meant to support people in making end of life planning wishes, whether immediately upon finding out of a terminal illness or well in advance. This advanced planning can help relieve some of the end of life stressors, both for the dying and the loved one. And this takes the form of workshops for me. I use the arts as an entry point into these topics to introduce some of this end of life planning with resources and getting people engaged through the creative process to access those resources. One of my favorite resources is from Luna Peak Foundation. They're an amazing nonprofit that support both the cancer and grief communities. Beyond Grief, this book here, um, it shares stories from folks anywhere from one to 60 years out of loss to show how unique and personal grief can look over time. I'm excited to share that I'm currently the artist and residence at Ma's House Studio on the Shinnecock Nation for the month of June, and I'm hosting an exhibition reception on June 18th from 5 to 7 p.m. if you'd like to see some of my new work in person. You can visit mazhouse.studio to learn more about this awesome project and the show info. And if you'd like to stay in touch and learn more about my, my work online, you can visit my website at briannalhb.com or on Instagram at briannalhb. Thank you all so much for your time and have a great rest of your night. Thank you, Brianna, for sharing your beautiful artwork. Um, I, I think it's quite remarkable because I think we don't have an easy relationship with death and, and grieving in our society. And, and it's just uh, amazing to see how uh, you transform it into something so beautiful. So can't wait to see your exhibition. Thank you. John Melillo is next. Um, John Melillo grew up on the east end of Long Island and is an avid fisherman. He is a disabled Vietnam veteran who finds solace through contemporary, contemporary realistic oil painting of his heritage. His art is geared to detail and storytelling through realistic presentation, enabling the viewer to create their own narrative. John started his career by taking numerous classes at the Art League of Long Island, Southampton Cultural Center, the School of Visual Arts, New York Academy of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum. He has business certificates from Christie's and Sotheby's and has been featured in many articles and TV appearances. Please welcome John. Um, I want to thank all the parish for this opportunity. I'm also humbled uh, to be included among all these accomplished uh, presenters. The button, the button. What you're looking at is the eastern end of Long Island where I've marked the locations where many of my works were inspired. It's all of 40 miles long by 15 miles wide. Notice all the different bodies of water, Long Island Sound, Peconic Bay, the Great South Bay, the magnificent Atlantic Ocean. Note we are presently sitting in Watermill, New York, marked in white. Our journey begins in Watermill, New York. This is James Corsworth's Grismill, 
About a half a mile from here on David's Lane, my grandparents were tenant potato farmers for the Halsey family in the early 1900s. My mother was born there. I chose to paint the mill itself realistically, but I let my passion for collective color go vibrant with the foliage and the sky. Going southwest is Flying Point Beach in Southampton, a family destination for cookouts in my early years. It also had an unusual sandbar and current. Many a shipwreck, even a German U-boat or beach whale would be washed ashore. My painting's new beginning represents the cycle of life. The sea represents the origin of life, the deteriorating hull the ending, and the brilliant skies herald a new beginning or rebirth. Heading east is Sagaponic, where my family had the Sea Breeze boarding house built in the 1700s. Many a noticeable uh, patron could be seen, including William de Kooning, John Steinbeck, and many others. I painted tea time in memory of the time as I would see guests enjoying tea and Sunday brunch on the front porch. Behind the boarding house was my family's farm, which included a large piece on Sag Pond. It had both a salt and freshwater source. My cousin and I would live a Tom Sawyer life, fishing, hunting, crabbing, and catching turtles on that most pristine body of water. The painting was in honor of that precious memory. Don't be afraid. Sag Beach on the ocean was another family outing destination about a mile from the farm. Back in the day, no lifeguards were present. Many a time I would see parents keeping close watch and assuring their children at the water's edge. This painting is dedicated to all the parents as well as mine that took us by the hand when life challenges seemed obvious. Winter cod fishing. On Long Island, uh, we call Montauk Point the ends and she can't go any further. Since I was four years old, my father would take me fishing there. It's a tradition I carry on today with my daughter. We sail in winter for cod 60 miles off the point, though ardent seas rage. You get breathless seeing a lone tr fishing trawler at dawn, sil silhouetted lead tin yellow and quizidone red. Uh, crossing from Monto Point to Orient Point is a treacherous racist current. Its square boiling waves would rival any body of water on the planet. Hundreds of boats have been lost. This painting is a constant reminder of the overwhelming force of nature. Staying in the dark umber tone created the mood and trepidation I wanted to express in this work. Navigating the races to dry land brings us to Orange State Park. It's a lone path two miles long by half a mile wide and it connects Peconic Bay to Long Island Sound. It has some of the most beautiful, pristine marsh and estuary networks. Teeming with wildlife inspired me to play in air paint this most wonderful setting. Traveling west is Mattituck. At sundown, I found this perfect setting from Diox purple to hands and yellow, compelling me to do a plein air endeavor. Funny story, on the farm before, I saw this woman on the porch with this magnificent fledging standing on her shoulder. So how many times in life do you get to ask a stranger, mind if I take a picture of your rooster? So, so Wally, as we called it, became the only imported to this work. Backtracking a few miles east, we ferry over to Shelter Island, Peconic Bay. It's where my grandparents first met around 1900. It's a virtual treasure of inspiration with its lush reeds and wildlife. Using various blues, my goal was to accent the orca reeds using coarse pumice in the strategic places and bringing forward the red-winged blackbird. Crossing Shelter Island, we ferried back to the South Fork in Sag Harbor. It was an old whaling town. My family owned the Black Bowie restaurant back in the day. My cousin and I would take a rowboat out flounder fishing where only yachts berth today. My daughter and I still fish out of the gorgeous inlets there. One day we came upon this remarkable setting I just had to preserve. Heading west along Peconic Bay, we come to Forster Beach in Noyak. This is a hidden gem that allows fire pits. At dusk, you can see many groups enjoying campfires and cookouts. I tried to capture the prismatic shift I witnessed one day from the campfire to the vibrant water and sky, which took me from a value of six in cad yellow to orange to red to violet blues. Separation, heading south brings us to grandmother's house. I remember a love for sunflowers. I remember seeing this vase full of them and a leaf falling, and I thought, the leaf by itself has given notoriety to the world on its own. The tragedy is one apart from the host. It's unprotected and subject to the laws of nature individually. This exposure could easily enact a shorter lifespan, maybe a life lesson. Lucky Horseshoe Wave, also in Southampton is Cooper's Beach, my favorite beach on the Atlantic Ocean. One day, while everybody was at playing the surf, I saw this horseshoe wave. I thought of good luck. It made me happy. I took a picture and just had to try to recreate this most enticing scene. Perspective. Behind Cooper's Beach is a long dock on the back bay. I've seen it many times over the years. One day, however, the viridian colored dock and somewhat violet cloud formations with its cast water reflections extenuated the perspective that just drew me in. It proved to be a very productive plein air endeavor. 
I fish out of the Shinnecock Inlet since the Carol the hurricane created in 1954. Today, my daughter and I fish pretty much 12 months a year. Many times we go through this inlet into the ocean. One day at dawn's early, early, early light, I caught this very special shot with her in the background. I feel I captured this very special moment in time that I hope will last forever. Going east is Pompa Bridge in Hampton Bays. At low tide, the shoreline recedes 100 yards. My father took me clamming here since I could walk. Today, the saga continues. One day, I caught the shot at dusk. I would note, except for the people, everything else was created in cat orange, ultramarine blue, and flake white. No brown was used. Color mixing just amazes me. Estuary. Also in Hampton Bay is the very small estuaries that lead to their portion of the Great South Bay. Again, accompanied by my daughter on a friend's boat, we ventured out for some uh, bay fishing. On the way out, I caught the scene of still water with stark reflections in phalo, king's blue, green umber, docks, and purple, and raw umber. Late in December, again with my trusty daughter, we ventured 80 miles through the Seven Richards Inlet to Roost the Canyon. We found ourselves all alone but for this trawler, whale, seals, and sharks, enjoying this most tranquil solitude. I did a tonal painting here using only blue, black, sap green, and titanium and white for everything but the boat. As a final thought, the east end of Long Island is just majestic. It's really a bucket list reality. Thank you. Thank you, John, for sharing your, your artwork with us and um, just really taking us through the wonders of the east end of Long Island, which is what really attracted so many of us to, to come out here, right? So thank you so much. Next is Ted Nemeth. He is currently enthralled with the challenges of his fifth professional career as a gypsy with a camera. Curious to see what that's like. Um, he, was, he previously worked on Wall Street and at two technology startups, then moved on to working with developmentally disabled adults before becoming a renowned leather craftsman with celebrity clients and projects worldwide. As a third generation filmmaker, Ted created a production company currently filming Optimism and travels the world creating videos for artists and charities to help drive awareness and encourage financial support. Please welcome Ted. Take a picture later. Huh? Cool. All right. This is fun. <laughs> thank you for thank you for coming. Um, yeah, I've been here uh, since '72 or yeah, '73. We moved here. <laughs> Where's my sister? Yes, my twin sister Chrissy. She's amazing. So, oh, I gotta press something. Uh, space bar. There we go. Ah, there's my twin sister. So that was when we moved here and. A uh, little after 72. Uh, so, um, uh, we turned 50 years old recently, which is just bonkers. <laughs> I'm on my fifth professional career. I worked on Wall Street for a few years, and I ran screaming from <laughs> that mess. Then I worked at two tech startups uh, for several years. Then, um, like she said, I worked at a, an agency for developmentally disabled adults here in uh, out east, and that was truly challenging, <laughs> even more rewarding though. And after several years of that, um, I somehow became a renowned leather craftsman. Um, I had projects around the world, <laughs> it was a, a thrill ride for sure, but um, it gets lonely in your workshop, you know, like 14 hours a day <laughs> toiling away. So I just, it's a romantic notion. <laughs> It's a romantic notion, the, the craftsman of the artist toiling away in their workshop, but it gets very lonely. So after 11 years of that, I knew I wanted to try something else. I had no idea what. Um, tried a bunch of things, trial and error, but eventually I found a video camera. And I created my own niche. So I traveled to these third world countries and I filmed for local charities and uh, create these videos to help drive donations to their website. <laughs> it's an adventure, so a gypsy with a camera. So, optimism. <laughs> um, I've met a, an astounding breadth of people around the world um, across all different domains, and I, I love meeting new people. That's, that's my drug. 
<laughs> and whiskey. But uh, I noticed this commonality across all these really amazing people that I'd meet. Um, the most accomplished, the most fulfilled, just the most fun to be around people all had the most optimism. Just seems to be this like fundamental ubiquitous trait across all of these real fun ass kickers in life. So I'm not talking about optimism like blind optimism where that you know, ignores common sense. Just a minimum effective dose of optimism that routinely informs you that everything is figure outable. <laughs> Just go, go get messy. <laughs> and that continually brings me back to that amazing um, Eleanor Roosevelt quote that was up a minute ago to do one thing every day that scares you, which is probably quite trite by this point, but when you really look at what she's telling us is, she's telling us to make it a habit of uh, do something that scares you means you're leaving your comfort zone. So she wants us to every day leave our comfort zone. And if you do that, fear gets discounted. You do realize everything is figure outable. It's a very powerful way to, to actually live. And uh, I know I live by the tenet that life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. <laughs> I like that. So this is my optimism machine right here. <laughs> Can I take a picture with you guys? <laughs> right. Three, two, one, yay! <laughs> um, all right, uh, well, how about that timing? I didn't time any of the slides, but that's pretty funny. Anyway. Um, Lastly, I want to tell you about this amazing charity that I met, that I discovered uh, recently. So I'm going there at the end of the year to film, and it's a, um, it's a local NGO in New Delhi, India. And they have a program that is run by street children for street children. And well, the managing editor, he's a veteran of the publishing world, but this NGO teaches these homeless kids how to read and write, how to find news stories that are gonna actually help other homeless kids, how to be journalists, how to uh, structure a news story, how to honor deadlines, how to format, print, distribute. So it's, um, it's a monthly publication. Um, they're up to like 8,000 distribution. And uh, oh, I can't wait, I'm gonna go film with them for a month and create a little documentary. And uh, that's gonna be the highlight of my career. I can't wait. So I'm gonna bring back a bunch of copies. And if anyone wants a copy of that, just give me your contact information and I'll make sure you get a, a copy of that. So, um, oh, there it is. That's the uh, NGO. Um, and lastly, huh? so my optimism machine and I will somehow, some way, at some point, create a video for uh, the World Wildlife Fund, the United Nations and UNICEF. <laughs> I have, I'm not skilled enough, I have no connections, but we're gonna get it done somehow. I have like this Forrest Gump luck, <laughs> is what all my friends tell me. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for watching, <laughs> listening. <laughs>
please come to the podium. Okay, uh, alors, good evening to all. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. This one. It's a... Growing up in Paris, I started my artistic career drawing squiggles, which I called Dika, on the wall of my Aunt Louise. What a treat for a two year old. In 1972, I started as a freelance photographer working for L'Hebdo des Femmes, a feminist magazine. In 79, I went to New York, where I fell in love with the city and with my Paul, my husband. I met the muralist Eva Cockcroft and started to paint with her. In 1983, we co-founded Artmakers, a non-for-profit organization to paint murals with and for the different communities in New York City. From 2011 to 2013, I designed and directed a series of four murals in Bushwick, Brooklyn, inspired by Federico Garcia Lorca and his poem, Sleepless City, celebrating the people of Hispanic heritage. My first art collectors, when I was three years old, were part of the well-known Atelier d'Architecture, LWD, in Paris. They acquired my series of paintings on papier cul, which were sheets of flat brown paper that scratches your ass but were fabulous to paint on. <laughs> Obscurantism will not prevail was a series of collages to denounce the lies of Bush, Cheney, and Blair during the Iraq war. In the name of religion, our so-called leaders assassinate children, women, and men every day. I always try to mix horror with humor, if possible. This painting was selected to be on the cover of the catalog, the windows and mirrors, reflection of the war in Afghanistan, a traveling exhibition curated by the American Friends Service Committee in Chicago in 2010 from artists around the country. This is from a series of paintings inspired by Omar Khayyam's The Rubaiyat. He was an astronomer, historian, philosopher, and poet from the 11th century Persia. His poetry still resonates as a celebration of living life to the fullest. To revive the essence of life, struggle, and creativity, I immersed myself in the poetry of Pablo Neruda. From there came a series of paintings that came from a joyous place of raw emotion, playing with the visible and invisible. In 2012, Karen Shaw of the Isley Museum curated the garbage barge. For my installation, Funiculus Umbilicalis, I became completely addicted to espresso and used more than 2,000 espresso coffee capsules. <laughs> I'm still addicted. In 1993, my family and I moved to East Hampton. I was captivated by the physical beauty of the land, the light, and the ocean. I created this symbolic chart of colors that identifies the many kinds of contaminants that pollute our air, water, and soil. In this photo, you can see a body in a pool of water dissolving, surrounded by oil, pesticides, ship pollution, and mercury using my color chart. I love playing with the ugly and the beautiful. In my series, Sky and Water, Sweet Poison, my muse, Jessica S., is surrounded by clouds of radioactivity, chemicals, and nitrogen. The following piece from the series, Ocean, deals with ocean acidification, pollution, and climate change. These all contribute to the catastrophic loss of life and ecosystems that will change the ocean as we know them forever. Back to Paris, in 1971, I was one of the three 400 women who signed a French petition known as the Manifesto des 343 Salopes. We declare that we had 
had an abortion, which was an act of civil disobedience since abortion was illegal. Shame on the GOP-nominated justices who are choosing to overturn Roe v. Wade. These two images are part of my hypodigiography. I find this medium to be very sensual, not sure why. The simplicity of it, the black line magically appearing on the screen to be spontaneous gives me a great joy. It's like a poem without words, and it gives me new energy, a desire for fantasy and abstract expression. Sometimes I like to borrow images from newspaper and the internet and play around using symbols, emojis, and colors. Especially when I make political imagery, I try to be direct and simple. <laughs> I like to cross all mediums, video, photography, drawing, painting, ceramic, installation, and soon, I hope, film animation and sculpture. Thank you. No, no, I'm not finished. I was, think, I was saying thank you for my friends. I'm sorry. This photo is part of the series that is a work in progress and global warming. My ISD is to take photos of iconic places with people, visiting them, or where I travel or lived, and superimposing images of the ocean to give the effect of submergence. Maybe the Paris Art Museum will be inspired to add this piece to his private collection. <laughs> Being an artist means to be true to yourself, to be honest, curious, critical, and to have a rage against all injustice. Be subversive and reinvent yourself every day. Be alive. My humble thanks to the team of the Paris Art Museum and to all of you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, for sharing your very direct takes on the beauty and the ugly and everything in between. And uh, I do hope that your vision about the parish underwater is not going to come true, honestly. <laughs> but thank you. All right, next up is Mark Seidenfeld. Um, academically trained as a lawyer, Mark Seidenfeld represented many international galleries and hovered around the art world until 1992 when Eliza Breton, the widow of André Breton, convinced him to start painting. That suggestion led to a volcano of creativity for Mark, who relies on intuition guided by inspiration to cultivate his own unique visual language and take artistic journeys into the unknown. His photographs and paintings have been featured in art publications and exhibitions and earned him representation in New York galleries. Please welcome Mark. Good evening. First, I want to thank the Parish Art Museum and Corinne Ernie for allowing artists like myself to present to you tonight. I will show you excerpts from my artwork from 1993 to the present in chronological order, because I believe there's an important story that the evolution tells. If you like my artwork, check out my website, markseidenfeld.com or see my work on Instagram or Facebook. My academic and professional training is in the law. In the winter of 1992, I began to paint, and it is as though I had unlocked a secret volcano inside me. That volcano has never stopped erupting. Now, as you see slides of my work, you might ask, why does this guy change his style? And I would answer, that I have never changed my style. What has changed, though, is the unknown and my perception of it. My style remains consistent. Be bold, experiment, go deeper, be true to my vision, and execute it to the best of my abilities. You see, in my opinion, for an artist to hone his or her own unique creative voice in order to create your unique language, you need to push your boundaries 
and enter the unknown. And your ticket to ride is imagination. And what is known or unknown is different for all of us. We each have our experiences, emotions, passions, and tastes, all unique to us. So only you can walk into your unknown because it is based upon your experience. And to complicate matters, the unknown is always changing because what was unknown in June becomes familiar territory in July. At the base of the mountain, you aspire to climb to the peak and it's only when you arrive there that you see the rest of the mountain range and it goes on and never stops. So the artist's journey is to move out of the comfortable places, to go where no one has dared to go before, to challenge yourself even if you might fail. Now, almost every culture has a myth about the hero's journey. The hero, basically, the hero leaves the comfort of home and wanders into the unknown, battling spirits, demons, and monsters along the way. When the hero is successful, he or she returns to save their people. Gilgamesh, Jason, Prometheus, Moses, Jesus, and Buddha are just a few examples of heroes that we're familiar with. The artist also takes the mythological hero's journey every time he or she sets an intention to go deeper and begin to work, no matter what the medium is. And at the beginning of that journey, the most powerful demon you meet, in fact, the very first, is doubt. Why am I doing this? Hasn't it been said better, expressed more eloquently before? Am I kidding myself? And on and on. It's a terrible panel discussion you have with yourself. If you give in, you're finished. You will not develop a unique voice. What you offer will not be visionary. I call this first challenge Black Kali, the mother who eats her children. She always appears and always challenges you. But if you fight against doubt and convince yourself that it is better to die today trying to reach for that dream than to live for a hundred years saying, I coulda, shoulda, woulda, then a shift happens. Black Kali, the demon turns into the mother of the universe. White Kali, who supports you. You will still go through trials by fire but doubt will no longer find a place for its claw in your heart. Another powerful thing happens when you face the unknown in your quest to forge your own voice. As an artist, you start out with an intellectual concept and you work on it, not knowing where you're going, but knowing that you need to take that journey. And sometimes the struggle stops and things just seem to flow. It's almost as though your piece is creating itself and you are as much an observer as you are a participant. It's an extraordinary experience. And when it happens, I call it the hook. The hook that makes you want to go back. Because when you're back in ordinary consciousness, you say to yourself, I want to find that place again, that expanded consciousness, because it is a place of magic. And that is available to all of us. Many people say they're not creative. They think that creativity is the craft of professional artists. And I respectfully disagree. In my opinion, art is an aspect of the human condition. It's not confined, confined to a canvas, instrument, or book. Life is the great art. We all have vision. So we all have the chance to be visionary. Do you take chances based upon what you truly believe? Or does Facebook and New York Magazine tell you how to live? Are you willing to reach out for what you really want? Are you, even if you might fail, walk a different path, blow up all compromise? At the end of the day, the real work of art is you. You are the product. Not the painting, not the song. Using creativity and imagination is a transformation accelerator. Once you've challenged yourself and survived, 
the whole world changes for you. New possibilities exist. So set your sails for the deep and uncharted waters. Be bold, take risks for what you believe in, and get ready for adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So full disclosure, Mark and I go back some 25 years. And we met in New York City. Um, we both uh, were avid uh, African. We, we took African dance classes. So I oh no, seriously, this is true. So I always knew that there was a lot more in you, Mark, than a lawyer. And uh, I'm glad you came out here and um, you know unleashed your your heroes, your demons, um, and your deepest uh, imaginations. And I think you really very eloquently talked about the, the creative process. So thank you. So uh, we will conclude tonight's Pecha Kucha with Denise Silva Dennis. Denise uh, also goes by the indigenous, na indigenous, indigenous name Wita Mo, and she's a member of the Shinnecock Nation here in Southampton. She is also part of the Hassanamisco Nation, Grafton, Massachusetts. A multidisciplinary artist, social justice activist, public speaker, and retired Southampton Elementary School art teacher. Vita Mo is also an accomplished beadwork craftswoman, and I've seen your work, it's beautiful. She learned the traditional Eastern Woodland style of beadwork from the elder women of the Shinnecock and Hassanamisco Nipmuc Nation, whose work includes traditional jewelry, breeded walking sticks, beaded pouches, and beaded cradle boards. Please welcome Denise. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to see a full house, and I just feel so honored to be here um, to the Pecha Kucha um, tonight. I'm a product of actually the Parish Art Museum and the Southampton Public School System. Um, 54 years ago, um, on Saturday mornings, when my mom um, signed my sister and I up for art lessons at the Parish Art Museum on Job's Lane, I could never you know, imagine in a million years that I would be attending and speaking on, at Pichacucha tonight. So thank you for the opportunity. I love being here and working with you, um, you all. Um, you know, people look at me and like, what are you? Like, where are you from? Well, I'm from 10,000, 13,000, 14,000 years ago because that is my, where I, my, um, Heritage comes from the Shinnecock people who lived here and also in Grafton, Massachusetts, where my um, dad is from. So my mom is from Shinnecock, my dad is from a Hassanabisco reservation. And they were, it, people have been admiring my um, hat that I have on tonight. It's called the Glen Gary um, cap. Um, Widamo Silva Arrow is my Native American name. My grandmother gave me that name, actually. And I also wanted to say Akwe in our language. And I wanted to say Nintampak because your friend's here tonight. Uh, Widamo Natisawis means that's my name. Widamo Nichapayamak is my last name. I was born an artist. I didn't have any materials. I'm the youngest of six children. You know, my older brothers and sisters, they were already going into college by the time I came along. So I used to do the same thing. I used to write on the sides of the wall at Ma's house because that's where I'm from, also Ma's house. But in the meanwhile, I had got an opportunity to be a part of In Beauty at Speak On, and it was a Native American children's art opportunity. So at a very young age, at the age of 12, um, two of my pieces actually went all across the United States to the Metropolitan Museum Art and the Smithsonian Institute. And this is Owl on the Branch. Um, as I said, I did not have a lot of materials, so I had to go into my brother's um, car modeling uh, paint set and use the paint and carefully put those little drops of the owl eyes there and then I resourced um, the oak tree branches in our yard. Um, my mom was my first teacher, so she taught me how to work with the seed beads. Uh, we didn't have a lot of material, so she, I asked her one summer, I said, Mom, could you show me? And so she pulled out the trunk that we use for powwow time, and little by little she showed me how to start doing beadwork. And I did that when, when I was 17 years old. 
uh, when I was at Hamilton College, this is a painting that I did, which is acrylic paint, and it was live models. Well, Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, no one looks like me. So I was like, hmm, then we have these live models, and I started painting them, but then I'm like, I miss home, and I want to paint Native Americans, so that's what I did. Um, as I got older, I took uh, classes on the reservation called um, SNAC, that's Shinnecock Native American Cultural Coalition, which my um, eldest sister and my brother-in-law founded. They were some of the founding people of that. And through America the Beautiful, they were able to bring in money for us to get different supplies. So I emerged more as a beadwork artist as well. Um, this is a medicine woman who's gathering uh, sacred pieces of plant um, that's in the Shinnecock Hills. That's one of the reasons why I'm such an activist because I'm trying to protect those things. You know, we don't need to bulldoze every single thing. There's limited resources out here. Um, this little girl, um, she represents a residential um, children who were taken away from all reservations all over the United States and Canada. And she's dressed in orange in order to honor those children who never came home. Can you imagine your child never coming home after being away at school? Uh, this is my husband and I with our newborn baby, our eldest child, Kelly Dennis. I had actually done that. Um, the papoose carrier when I was away in college for a special uh, project, a winter project. So Kelly was the first baby after many babies have been in that um, with my relatives and nieces and nephews. And when Kelly turned a year old in preparation for the Shinnecock powwow, I put together this beadwork using seed beads and um, bone and shell and rabbit fur and deer skin leather and just, you know, has the uh, the flowers that represent the Eastern Woodland people. Uh, this is a historical uh, mural that's on the Shinnecock Reservation. And I did this through a, a parent group. They were looking for ways to bring all the parents together to work with the children. And this was like just about 30 years ago. So it shows the, the corn mother who's growing corn, beans, and squash. It shows the whalers of our traditional people as well. Uh, this is a beadwork piece that I did for my father-in-law. Um, his name was Chief Eagle Eye, um, or Avery Dennis Sr. And it has seed beads again, and also glass beads are part of that. Um, and he wore it proudly. And, uh, so, and then this one is one of my activist days. I'm there holding the American flag umbrella. Um, this is Shinnecock Hills. It's part of the places that are being dug up. Um, so many people came out from New York City and other places to live safely out here on the East End, but so many of our grave sites are being disturbed. This is one of the um, elders. Her name was Princess Noah Donna. She died in 1975. I was 15 when she passed away, but she gave me so much um, strength through her teachings. And one thing she said is, go back and get Shinnecock Hills back. So that is why I'm one of the advocates. And here we are, we were able to secure um, what's called Sugarloaf. And there's over 10,000 remains at least at Sugarloaf. So we were finally able to get that back. And this is a newspaper account. Um, and that's our a traditional flag of Shinnecock showing the whaling um, there. Um, this is also something that I design. Um, I design the logos for um, different organizations that I'm part of. It says a warrior. People think of a warrior as someone who's going to hurt you. A warrior um, here in this instant is someone who's going to protect you. So we, our whole thing is to protect, protect our um, ancestors. These two particular paintings, not the last of the tenacious Shinnecock Indians. My daughter said, why did you have to put tenacious? Nobody's going to know what tenacious means. And I'm like, I'm a teacher, so let's learn what tenacious means. So tenacious is holding on to culture, holding on to language, retrieving it. So that's why I use that. And also that had land back in it. So that was also featured here. So thank you for that. Um, this is something at the African American Museum in Southampton on North Sea Road, which my son curated, actually curated the other one from outcropping a couple of months ago. This is now on display, Nothing Good um, Comes Easy by Randy Con Conquest. He was one of the barbers there at that museum. It's magnificent. You have to go see that museum too. And I just want to welcome and tell everybody when it comes time for the September 2nd through the 5th Labor Day weekend uh, powwow, I hope that you all come because we'll, we'll be very happy to have you all and to learn more about our culture and our history. Thank
Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much for sharing your work and, and uh, your, your life. And uh, I have to say, I learned so much about the Shinnecock Nation, the history um, and the culture by talking to you and your family and also your son, Jeremy Dennis, who is a wonderful photographer. So thank you so much and thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. And please give another warm round of apl applause to our presenters. Thank you. And thank you to all of our members. If you become a member here at the parish, you can come to a lot of these events for free or for a reduced uh, price. So thank you. And we're here every Friday night. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.